So in this video, we're going to explore a concept known as equilibrium, and we're going to explore this concept in terms of acid and bases. So in equilibrium, there are two reactions taking place. A reversible reaction proceeds in both the forward and reverse directions. When we were looking at our conjugate acid-base reactions, you could see that we had two arrows, where we had one arrow in the forward direction and one arrow in the backward direction. And that's what we're going to look at here. Let me just fix this equation down here. It should be a forward arrow and a reverse arrow. So what this is saying, in the forward reaction you have hydrofluoric acid, which is your Bronsted acid reacting with water, which is a Bronsted base. Hydrofluoric acid is transferring a hydrogen to water. We are going to form the conjugate base, F minus, and the conjugate acid of H3O plus, or the hydronium ion. Equilibrium is a state when there is no further change in the concentration of the reactants and the products. So the rate of that forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. So initially, when we remix these two reactants together, what you'll see is, is a decrease in the concentration of the reactants and an increase in the concentration of the products. Equilibrium is the point at which that concentration is no longer changing. You are still having the forward reaction and the reverse reaction, however they are occurring at the same rate. So let's see if we can complete the following statements with either equal, not equal, faster or slower, or change or do not change. Before equilibrium is reached, the concentrations of the reactants and products change. Initially, reactants have a reaction rate blank than the rate of reaction of products. That should be faster because we are trying to form products and we have a higher concentration of reactants. At equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction should be equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. At equilibrium, the concentrations of the reactants and products, that is the amounts, do not change. In 1884, the French chemist and engineer Henri Louis Le Chatelier proposed one of the central concepts of chemical equilibria. His principle states, a change in one of the variables that describe a system at equilibrium produces a shift in the position of the equilibrium that counteracts the effect of this change. So when the system at equilibrium is stressed, the rate of the forward and reverse reaction will adjust to relieve this stress. There are three ways which we can change the conditions of a chemical reaction at equilibrium. So three ways in which we can stress the system. We can change the concentration of one of the components or a reactant or product. We can change the pressure or we can change the temperature. What we're going to focus on here with acid and bases is what happens when we change the concentration of a reactant or product. So here in the schematic, you can see you're at equilibrium. The level of water is equal in tank A and tank B, and water can flow between the two tanks. If we increase the amount of water in tank A and flow is still open, you're going to see a change so that water flows into tank B. So we are going to increase the rate of the forward reaction until we establish equilibrium where the water levels are equal. So let's look at this in the context of a reaction. We have HF plus water. Let me put my arrows in for the forward reaction and the reverse reaction. Our products will be F minus and H3O plus. If we increase the concentration of HF, of our hydrofluoric acid, this is going to put stress on the system that will be relieved by increasing the rate of the forward reaction. So Le Chatelier's principle states that if we add more reactants, we're putting stress on the reactant side to increase the reactants, the rate of the forward reaction will increase to produce more products. That is how we are going to relieve stress and reestablish equilibrium. 
Now let's see what happens if we remove some HF. Let me put my arrows back in. So now we're going to decrease the amount of HF. As we decrease the amount of HF, the equilibrium is going to reestablish itself to favor an increased rate of the reversed reaction. So some products will go to form more reactant. So now we're removing HF. In order to relieve stress, we are going to increase the rate of the reverse reaction. All right, now let's look at what happens on the product side. All right, we're going to add more F minus, so we're going to increase the concentration of the products. This is going to put stress on the system, and that stress will be relieved by increasing the rate of the reverse reaction. We are going to shift to form more reactants. Here in table 10.4, we're summarizing the effects of changing the concentrations on the equilibrium. So if the stress is to add a reactant, we are going to increase the rate of the forward reaction and make more products. If we remove reactant, we are going to decrease the rate of the forward reaction, increase the rate of the reverse reaction, and produce more reactants. If we add product, we increase the rate of the reverse reaction, and we make more reactants. If we remove product, we decrease the reverse reaction, increase the forward reaction, and make more products. So this can be linked to the transport of oxygen in the body. Again, let me put the arrows in. I'm not sure why they're not copying over. But oxygen transport involves an equilibrium reaction between hemoglobin and oxygen and oxyhemoglobin. So you can see our reactants are aqueous hemoglobin and dissolved oxygen. Our product is oxyhemoglobin. When oxygen levels are high in the lungs, the reaction shifts in the direction of oxyhemoglobin. This allows hemoglobin to bind oxygen. In the tissues where oxygen concentration is low, the reverse reaction releases the oxygen from hemoglobin. So if you have active tissue that's deficient in oxygen, what you're essentially doing is removing a reactant. By removing a reactant, you're going to shift the equilibrium and hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, will release its oxygen to form oxygen and hemoglobin, thereby delivering oxygen to the tissues. So let me just state that again because this is important to relate this concept to our biochemistry. When we have active tissue that needs oxygen, it's low in oxygen, so that essentially means we are removing one of the reactants. In order to relieve the stress on the system, your oxyhemoglobin will release oxygen, forming hemoglobin and oxygen, and then that oxygen can be taken up by the tissues that need it. So in the previous slide, I explained to you how oxygen is delivered to the tissues. So at normal atmospheric pressure, you have a high partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs. So that is why hemoglobin binds oxygen and forms oxyhemoglobin. In the tissue, you have a low partial pressure of oxygen. So that is why, in the tissue, oxyhemoglobin releases oxygen to the tissue. When a person climbs in high altitudes, they typically receive less oxygen because the partial pressure of oxygen is lower at a higher altitude. As a result, their tissue is not getting enough oxygen, and they undergo a condition known as hypoxia. It's characterized by increased respiratory rate, and you have symptoms such as a headache, decreased mental acuteness, fatigue, and decreased physical coordination. So typically, what happens when you're going to be at high altitudes, you need to acclimate before you do strenuous physical activity. As you acclimate, your body produces more red blood cells and you have more hemoglobin. So as a result of having more hemoglobin, we can pick up more oxygen in the lungs and make more oxyhemoglobin that can then deliver that oxygen to the tissues. So again, we're shifting that equilibrium. We, as we acclimate to a higher altitude, we make more hemoglobin that allows us to pick up more oxygen so that our tissues could then get that oxygen. All right, so let's do a learning check. Again, I'm sorry those A's are coming over. It should be a forward arrow and a reverse arrow. Use Le Chatelier's principle to predict whether the system shifts in the direction of products or reactants for each of the following.
So here we have an acid-base reaction where we have carbonic acid and water, and we make the hydronium ion and bicarbonate. This reaction is found in our blood. So if we add carbonic acid, so we're increasing a reactant, the equilibrium should shift to the products. All right, that's how we're going to relieve stress on the system. So here are the answers typed out. If we increase the concentration of a reactant, the reaction will shift towards the products. Here if we remove a product, we're going to still shift towards the products because we still have to reestablish the equilibrium. And then finally, if we add a product, we're going to shift towards the reactants to reestablish the equilibrium. What we're going to do now in this section of the video is we're going to continue with this concept of equilibrium, but we're going to look at the dissociation of water. And again, let me draw those arrows in. So what this reaction is saying to you is, is that liquid water can dissociate into ions, and the two ions that will be present are going to be H3O plus and OH minus, so the hydronium ion and the hydroxide ion. So water is known as an amphoteric substance. This means it can act as an acid or a base. In water, H plus is transferred from one molecule of water to another. So one molecule is acting as a Bronsted acid, while the other molecule is acting as a Bronsted base. Equilibrium is reached between the conjugate acid-base pairs so that you have a balance between your hydronium ion and your hydroxide ion. In the equation, again, for the dissociation of water, there is both a forward and a reverse reaction. In pure water, the concentration of H3O plus and OH minus at 25 degrees is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7 molar. The concentrations are equal of these two ions in pure water. When we have an equilibrium, we can typically write an equilibrium expression. The equilibrium expression is the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants. So if we were to write an equilibrium expression for this dissociation, we would have the concentration of H3O plus times the concentration of OH minus divided by the concentration of water times the concentration of water. Now, if you look at this concentration of 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molar, it's very small. The concentration of the reactant water is much higher than the concentration of those two ions. So we can ignore it from the equilibrium expression. When we ignore it from the equilibrium expression, we get a special type of equilibrium called the KW, which is going to be the concentration of H3O plus times the concentration of hydroxide. When you multiply 1 times 10 to the minus 7 times 1 times 10 to the minus 7, we get 1 times 10 to the minus 14. So that is the Kw for water at 25 degrees Celsius. When you're writing an equilibrium expression, the concentration units are omitted. We're going to use this dissociation into H3O plus and OH minus to define when a solution is acidic or basic or neutral. So when the concentration of H3O plus and hydroxide are equal, you have a neutral solution. If you have more H3O plus than hydroxide, your solution is acidic. And if you have more hydroxide than hydronium, the solution is basic. So let's look at this graphically. If the concentration of the two ions is equal at 10 to the minus 7, we have a neutral solution. If the concentration of H3O plus is more than the concentration of hydroxide, we have an acidic solution. Now just look at this graph for me, please. You can see that the product of these two is 10 to the minus 14. If the hydrogen ion concentration is between 10 to the minus 7 and 10 to the 0, 
it is greater than the hydroxide concentration and your solution is acidic. So let's just say we had an exponent of 10 to the minus six, realize that you have more hydronium ion present than hydroxide ion present. Now let's look at a basic solution. That's where your OH minus concentration exceeds your hydronium ion concentration. Again, so if the hydroxide concentration is between 10 to the minus seven or greater, then you have a basic solution. All right, so here is a table that gives you examples of the hydronium and hydroxide concentrations in neutral, acidic, and basic solutions. So again, neutral, you're equal. In an acidic solution, look here. So you have 10 to the minus two for the hydronium ion. For in another acidic solution, you have 10 to the minus five for the hydronium ion. In a basic solution, that's where you're going to have a greater concentration of hydroxide. So here you're looking at minus six and minus four. Always the product is times 10 to the minus 14. So if we know the hydronium concentration of a solution, we can use this KW, that one times 10 to the minus 14, to calculate the concentration of hydroxide. So the KW is always going to be one times 10 to the minus 14, and we can use that to determine the concentration of hydroxide if we know the concentration of hydronium. We can also do the reverse. If we know the concentration of hydroxide, we can use this KW to calculate the hydronium concentration. So let's do an actual problem. What is the hydronium concentration of a solution if the hydroxide concentration is five times 10 to the minus eight molar? So we're given the hydroxide concentration. We are also know that one times 10 to the minus 14 equals the KW. So what we can do is, is we can solve for the hydronium ion concentration. So if we have one times 10 to the minus 14 divided by five times 10 to the minus eight, the hydronium concentration is two times 10 to the minus seven molar. This concentration is larger than the hydroxide concentration, so the solution is acidic. Let's do a learning check. If lemon juice has a hydronium concentration of two times 10 to the minus three, what is the hydroxide concentration of the solution? So you should realize that this is an acidic solution because the hydronium concentration is more than times one times 10 to the minus seven. So we're gonna take 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14 and say it equals H3O plus times OH minus. And then we're going to say 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14 equals two times 10 to the minus three times the hydroxide ion concentration. And our answer will be five times 10 to the minus 12 molar. And you need two significant figures because you have two significant figures in the given value. These are the types of calculations that you're going to have to do for the KW. In the next video, we're going to get into the pH, which is just using the log of the KW.